Um, all right, so chapter three, uh, review of our mod modeling fundamentals. Uh, I think this is a cool chapter, um, you know, because it really goes over like a lot of what makes uh, R kind of unique or, you know, indirectly kind of highlights that where, you know, R is written by statisticians and you kind of really see it um, in some of the base package, the stats package, all the built-in functionality that comes in with R. Um, so yeah, this is kind of a cool topic to discuss, even though it's kind of one of the earlier chapters. Uh, so yeah, we've got all these learning objectives. Hopefully I will touch on all of them uh, throughout. Uh, but yeah, let's go ahead. So the R formula syntax. Uh, yeah, really one of the things that I think makes R unique is this formula syntax. Um, so for our purposes, I'm going to use this uh, first uh, or the previous data from the package, um, and just to be different from what the what the book was doing. Uh, so there's it's a pretty simple data set. As you can see, there's a height, volume, and girth. Uh, girth is a sort of a measurement of diameter. Uh, just for reference, I went ahead and put the diagram on here. Uh, the cool thing about this is that there's kind of like an analytical way to, you know, calculate volume given, you know, diameter and height. Uh, you know, we're only given girth, which is sort of an approximation of one of these diameters. Uh, but, you know, when we come and uh, model it, we should be pretty close to it. Uh, so uh, just to look at simple correlations with the data, we can see that volume is pretty highly correlated with uh, girth. So vo volume is, uh, is what we'll end up uh, modeling here. But uh, it's good to know that like one of our predictors are pretty highly, highly correlated already. Uh, so, you know, given a data set with two columns, uh, you know, first thing that comes to mind is the scatter plot. So what are you doing if, you're, if you don't plot a scatter <laughs> of a data set with two variables? So here you know, we get a little bit of an idea. Our Y variable is encoded as size, so maybe it's not the best plot. But just something to you know get us started by looking at the data. Okay, so we'll go ahead and go on to the modeling part. Uh, and cool thing about R, you know, uh, a regression model is you know one line of code. Uh, and here we see kind of the power of that formula syntax already, where we don't have to list out all the columns, uh, all our feature columns. Um, we just take our target column, our response variable volume, put that on the left hand side of the formula and use a dot to represent every other column uh, in the data frame uh, represented by data equals trees. So, you know, we can assign that to a variable and print it out and look, we get our coefficients you know, for the model. Basic statistical modeling with R. Uh, you know, if you wanted to be really explicit about this, you could, uh, you know, actually list out the columns. That gets really tedious, obviously, if you have a lot of columns. You know, in this case, it's just two, so you could do that. Um, but yeah, obviously, if you, have, if you have hundreds of columns, you don't want to do that. So that's really showcasing some of the power of the formula. Uh, the thing I do a lot of times with formulas, because I like to pipe things a lot, is like I'll pipe in the data, and data happens to be the second argument. So if you do do that, just be aware that you should wrap your formula around formula if you're also using a dot in the formula. That way, the dot in the formula, you know, represents the extra columns. Uh, you know, the columns that aren't the response variable and, and the dot in data represents you, the data frame that you're passing in. Now, you only would have to do that if you like to use pipes everywhere, um, but otherwise you'll be fine. Uh, so cool thing about uh, formulas is you can add interaction terms really easily just by changing your plus sign to a asterisk or a multiplication sign. Uh, it automatically creates a interaction term between girth and height. Uh, and, you know, looking back at the analytical formula for volume, we'll see, you know, diameter and height are multiplied at some uh, here. So it's probably going to be helpful for a model um, to include an interaction term there. And we'll see that later when we evaluate the model. Uh, so get going beyond that, polynomial terms are really easy to add. Just we use this uh, special I function, um, identity function. I'm, I'm not really sure what it stands for. Uh, to indicate a second order term here. And, you know, when we, we get the model printout, you know, we see 
this uh, second order term here. Uh, so I'm kind of, I mean, we'll get to the point where we're evaluating it, but just speculating, we can guess maybe that's going to be helpful for the model, given again, our, you know, analytical formula has, you know, a D multiplied by itself, so square root by itself. And, you know, we can go on, excluding a column is really easy. So again, say you had 100 columns, but then you didn't want to include one column. That's where this would be really helpful. Here, we just use uh, the minus sign to, to indicate let's not use height. And, we, okay, and then we don't see height in the model output. For, uh, and then also in some cases, you don't want to include an intercept. Um, we won't, I mean, it depends on the situation, but it's as easy as including plus uh, zero. I think there's another way to do it, like minus one or something. Um, but that just, again, shows kind of like the power of the formula syntax. And again, we don't see the intercept term in our model printout. And okay, so we didn't have any uh, categorical variables or factors in our in that data frame, so I'm just going to add one here, uh, just adding letters, um, four groups of letters here, and assigning our uh, data frame to trees two. And so we see the group column all the way to the right here. Uh, so the purpose of that is just to illustrate how you know the the formula syntax really helps you uh, by knowing that your category, knowing where the categorical variables are and automatically creating dummy variables for you. So, you know, here again, I just did volume, uh, you know, regress on every other uh, variable and it knows to uh, create dummy variables for your categorical variable. So we see group B, group C, and group D. Now group A is kind of, it's captured in the intercept. You know, if you wanted to have that group A term as well, there's ways of doing that, you know, not include the intercept term. Um, it, there might be uh, other ways, but I, um, you could do that as well if, you, if, if it helps your um, model interpretive, interpretability to have um, you know, all four groups there. So yeah, under the hood, I, I don't know if anyone's interested, but like I always thought it's kind of cool. Like you could kind of generate that yourself just by using this model matrix uh, formula. Um, and you see how it kind of encodes your uh, factor variable uh, as binary uh, variables. So, so yeah, that's, there yeah, was a, a question in the chat, and I don't know, and I don't know if you know if there's like a comprehensive guide to R's formula syntax anywhere, or even a cheat sheet. Ooh, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I'm sure there probably is somewhere. I don't think it's really in the help documentation. Um, Found it. <laughs> But no, I don't know. I, I'm not aware of any. I just, I just kind of remembered all of this from like, you know, schooling or various things that I read. So, I don't know. Yeah, that'd be probably pretty helpful if, um, if people are just kind of new to modeling. But yeah, if anyone has a link, you know, obviously uh, share it. Um, oh yeah, so I think we covered kind of indirectly all these um, important points about formulas. So the formula defines the columns that are used by the model. So yes, you have to define your response variable on the left-hand side, uh, but then you can use a dot or you can actually explicitly list all the columns on the right-hand side. Um, the standard R, uh, so second point, the standard R machinery uses the formula to encode the, the columns into an appropriate format. So this is a reference to that dummy variable um, power that we saw of, of the syntax, uh, uh, the formula syntax here. Uh, and then, yeah, the roles of the columns are defined by the formula. So I, I think this is just kind of, I don't know, blending those two points together. Like if you list a column on the left-hand side of the formula, that's your response variable. And then every other variable or anything you list on the right-hand side is are the feature or the dependent variables. Okay. So now we'll go on to the part of evaluating the models. Like how do you know your model is good? So, you know, you could just look at the coefficients. Oftentimes that's, you'll end up wanting to look at the coefficients for if you're doing inference. Um, but yeah, you should evaluate whether your model is good. Uh, even though, if, even if you're not doing using your model for, you know, predictive purposes, it should like still have, you know, a somewhat good R squared or, you know, whatever base, compared to whatever baseline you're looking at. Um, so, you know, typical ways to look at that kind of stuff is uh, with diagnostic plots. And so ours, uh, you know, base and stats um, packages are ready. Uh, they're able to interpret your uh, linear regression object. And when you call plot on it, plot on uh, regfit, 
it knows to print out some diagnostic plots. So here we're looking at the residuals versus the fitted um, observations um, on the left-hand side. And we do see, so, you know, theoretically this smooth red line or just the general trend in the points should look like white noise or, or you know, the smooth line should kind of look horizontal to zero and be along the zero, the y equals zero plane. In this case, we see that there's, you know, clearly some kind of like squared um, profile here. So that's kind of telling us we could do better with this model. Um, the QQ plot uh, looks fine. We do, we would expect, you know, all the points to kind of line up, you know, uh, diagonally as they do. Uh, and I just wanted to point out here, if you don't like base R's plotting <laughs> look, you can kind of do this uh, with GG Fortify. Basically the same kind of call using an auto plot. I've used that a couple of times just to, I don't know, it makes me feel better about what I'm doing. <laughs> um, so, okay, yeah, so let's go on to the coefficients. You know, we could fix that model and then, you know, we'll, we'll look at that in a second. But yeah, what about the coefficients? Everyone wants to know about the coefficients. What about the p-values, right? So like, this is where you look for the significance in the, in, in the coefficients. Um, so here you're seeing this, you know, the three stars, this is what we look for in the output. Um, and that, so that's telling us that this term is significant. Um, same with girth. Uh, height may or may not be significant depending on what your level of significance here is. So you can look at the significance codes at the bottom and see, look, okay, this is significant at an alpha a value of uh, 0 0.05. So, you know, that's kind of the, you know, the gold standard level of uh, significance there. So in this case, we might say it's significant. Uh, if you're doing like physics research, you might need a p-value under 0 0.001. So that's where you need um, that three stars and, and the p-values. Uh, so obviously this kind of, this is messy output. And if you look at it and you save it in an object, it would be a list object um, with the coefficients and other things. Uh, so just proving a little bit of the power of tidy models in its various packages. And we can look at Broom here and see the tidy output. You know, it's always going to print out a data frame for us. You know, it's all the same um, values. Uh, and in fact, actually, it separates it a little bit for us because right here we're seeing a blending of the coefficient values uh, and also, you know, the overall model um, evaluations like numbers. So there's actually two separate functions to do that, tidy and then glance. So we can get all the same numbers in those, you know, two different functions. And it really helps um, decompose what we're doing and why, uh, you know, yeah, separating those things. So because those are different things, right? Like you're, one is evaluating the whole model and one is, uh, you know, looking at the coefficients and um, those are used for two different things. Okay, uh, so again, previewing a little bit of the power of you know, combining base R with tidyverse and tidy models. Here we're going to take all those, uh, you know, regression fits we had earlier, the, um, the, including the interaction fit, the polynomial fit, uh, and others. And we can put them in a list and we can use map the four. And, and then we can use select and arrange to kind of come up with this, uh, you know, tidy data frame here at the end uh, to show us that the polynomial fit has a, the highest R, adjusted R squared, um, indicating that's it's probably the best model of those here. Um, you could use other, you know, evaluation metrics, but that's what the one we'll use, uh, you know, just for here. And you know, you can you can use uh, other deployer functions. If, you know, if we're going to look at that trees two data set that we uh, created with the the dummy or the, or the factor column. You might want to fit a regression on each subgroup there, so we can kind of we can do that pretty easily with you know deployer functions and map. So yeah, we're using it, in fact, all the Broom functions here. So we have tidy, glance, and augment. Uh, and we're using the power of maps to kind of, uh, to iterate over each um, group, which when you do a group nest, and I don't, I guess I don't have it printed out here, but it's like a list of data frames, if I remember, or it's a data frame with nested list columns, right? So you're acting upon each of those list columns with the mapping function. And then applying each of those broom function tidy glance augments the predict uh, broom function. You're you know applying each of those and saving those all to a singular object um, that we might consider tidy because it has everything in a tidy format. Uh, and yeah, we can 
uh, select and unnest each of these components individually to see um, what they look like. Uh, so I probably should have printed out which model or which group it belongs to here, but I guess, we'll, so the first three or columns here or first three rows here belong to group A and then et cetera, et cetera, all the way to group D. Um, we can, I guess, yeah, look at these coefficients depending on what you're trying to do. Um, and in this case, I, I think we'd probably be comparing models, uh, the submodels here. So we'd probably be more interested in the glanced output. So looking at how uh, the adjusted R squared is for each of these submodels. And they're all pretty close to 0.9, um, you know, depending on what your baseline is, that might be good, that might not be good. And, and then showcasing this other room function we haven't talked about yet, yet uh, augmented, which is uh, uh, just the predict function. It's, it's nice because it includes um, all these extra columns here with the residual, the standardized residual, you know, Cook's distance if you need that. So it's more than just predict and it, it comes in a tidy uh, data frame output. Okay, uh, so that's it for that. We're going to go on to some more base R yeah. stats package. Question that I've actually had too. Uh, what's the difference between modeling each subgroup separately versus adding the subgroup as a term in the model that contains all the subgroups? Yeah, uh, I'd have to look at it. Yeah, I, I think it depends on Inference, if, if you were wanting specifically to look at, you know, does the coefficient for each of those terms, right? You wouldn't, in that case, you wouldn't create all those submodels. You'd have just the one uh, main model and have the dummy terms for each of those. If you're like specifically trying to interpret, you know, the coefficient for that term. Um, I think you would do the submodels approach. Maybe if it's more predictive, like you're just trying to fit, uh, you know, if it's a tree in group A, you want to know exactly what its volume will be when you like when you add another tree into that group. So I think it's probably yeah, it just depends maybe what you're doing, you know, predictive versus inference of the you know looking at the coefficients. Uh, that's just my thought. I think we probably have a lot of smart people in the chat <laughs> that can correct me about that if I'm wrong or or not. Uh, okay, so yeah, um, quick look at ANOVA. So ANOVA is a, uh, a function in base R specifically for looking at, you know, two regression fits, usually uh, one being a subset of the other. So in, in this case, we have the, the reg fit and the poly fit. Uh, so the polynomial fit, if you remember, just has that extra second order term. So we're interested in knowing, does that second order term uh, improve the model? Uh, so that's what this ANOVA test is, is doing. It's looking at calculating the year F statistic and doing looking at the probability of having that F statistic. And here it shows that yes, adding that, you know, that second order term does improve uh, our, our model. And, um, and we could have guessed that, right? Like from looking at the uh, analytical formula for the model where uh, we have that diameter squared term. So it kind of makes sense that adding that term really does help the model. I think there's other ways of going about this. You could do like a stepwise regression um, that's not really covered uh, in the chapter, but that's another way of kind of looking at terms and you know adding them to the model model and, or versus excluding them. Uh, but yeah, I know those are kind of a common task for statisticians, so worth covering here. And if you were in the the Herald Book Club, you've probably already seen this meme, but ANOVA is really just kind of like a regression, it's specifically one way ANOVA. So here we're doing two way. Uh, like ANOVA kind of comparing two models, but there's also ANOVA that's really just uh, univariate regression where uh, your one dependent variable is just a factor variable. But I think it's funny because I get these terms mixed up all the time as well. And like, they're all different, but at the same time, they all just use regression. So I think it's, <laughs> it's funny to just kind of keep some context about that. And by the way, thanks for showing the details. Uh, functionality last week. I didn't know about that you could do all this stuff. So it's been really helpful because uh, otherwise my memes would be ruined if I just like left them out in the open in this book down. Uh, okay, so more showcasing of just base R functionality. Uh, this is kind of like Wait, a little bit uh, like... Scott had a really good observation and I think he should just share it in the, you know, out loud. 
Okay, John. Yeah, I um, you know, AOV stands for analysis of variance, and um, I was like, well, what's the difference between ANOVA and AOV? And I I used to try to use one when I probably should have been using the other, and uh, it it finally, you know, I went and looked it up one time, and AOV is actually like an extension of an LM, a linear model object, because um, it actually calls LM, whereas ANOVA, like we saw here from Tony is a, a function that lets us look at the, you know, the results of a fitted model or, you know, compare a couple of them. So they're actually two just very different things, even though they sound similar in terms yeah. of the, the terminology. Right. I, uh, I just like, when I was like reading through this, I was like, I had to go through that again. And I still don't know if I'm like explaining it as well as it could be. I mean, I guess it's easy for me to just think of this function you use to compare it to regression models, but you can definitely use, I think the, in that case, the AOV function, if you're just using it for a single model to kind of like look at a categorical variable. Yeah. So it's confusing, but I, I don't know. Um, okay, so yeah, going on to, you know, if you're not doing regression, another common task is simulation type of things or looking at distribution. So I pulled up this question. This actually came from a class I took <laughs> before on simulation um, where we were asked to look at you know, what, what is the sum of two uh, uniform variables? What does that distribution look like? And I don't know, you're tempted to think, oh, it's just another uniform vari uh, a distribution. But when you actually, you know, model it out, what you can do with uh, our random uniform, um, you can add them together and you see that the resulting distribution is actually triangular. Um, so yeah, uh, there I am using base R graphics, but it's just convenient in this case. Uh, and then there's just like a lot of like functions like, you know, R unif has D unif, uh, Q unif, P unif, um, standing for like probability uh, uniform, quantile uniform, all that. There's just like a lot of stuff that comes with base and stats um, that, you know, it's great that you don't have to like download a package or, you know, load in a package to use. Um, in fact, I, this the other day I, I was doing this where I wrote a function <laughs> with data and I forgot like I had DF in my function. And so DF is actually like an actual stats function for uh, the F distribution, the density of the F distribution. So my error is like kind of cryptic. I think it was more cryptic than this because this kind of just indicates mutates is the error. Um, but <laughs> it like indicated, you know, that, like there was a missing function or something. Uh, so I just thought that was funny. Like if you actually print out you know, DF when you haven't assigned it to something, you know, it shows you uh, that, yeah, it's actually a function in the stats package. So, um, okay, yeah, so I think this is the big, the heart of the chapter and like, you know, R, you know, R already has all this great functionality for modeling. So why do we need more or why do we need tidy, tidy models at all? And so I'm kind of just uh, copy pasted a little bit of the uh, manifesto here because I think it's just so important. I don't know if I can like distill it in any way. So, so first of all, it's human-centered. So specifically with, with the Tidyverse is uh, you know, designed to help you know, analysts with their day-to-day -day jobs. It's really great for uh, EDA. And so let's think about that in, in terms of you know, tidy models. I think recipes and parsnip, uh, the way that they always have you know, print out data frames or you know, you're always working with data frames, that's really convenient for people that are really used to doing that. I know like, you know, before I use carrot or tiny models, you know, going to matrices and vectors, okay, maybe not as much vectors, but using matrices was always like, I don't know, it was, I felt like there was a, a knowledge gap there that, <laughs> you know, just because I'm so used to using data frames, but then going to, you know, create a model, you have to use matrices. It just always felt a little awkward for me. Uh, so I think it's really convenient for people to always have data frames because that's what most people use, uh, you know, outside of modeling. And, you know, going along with the human-centered aspect is the consistent aspect. And, you know, we already we see this with predict. So actually, you know, based on our stats, the state stats package do a good job of, you know, with the, the whole method dispatch, right? The, the predict function um, on, a, a, you know, a linear regression model, a logistic regression model, um, you can pass that into predict and it'll give you a prediction. You don't have to have a specific function uh, for, you know, LM object. You know, it's not a predict LM, it's predict. You just pass in your LM object. 
So that, that you know, that's all object-oriented programming behind the scenes. Um, but it's good that that's kind of implemented there. Um, in some ways, you know, uh, when people write packages, um, you know, outside of just stats and base. So let's say it's like the R part package, which is for like random forest uh, or tree uh, decision trees. Uh, I think the the predict function there, you pass in when you're specifically doing classification. Um, you pass in a different named variable for to indicate I want, I want the probabilities uh, of you know being zero or one. I think you know there's a really great table in the book, and I didn't want to copy paste it here, but uh, that explains like uh, you know predict functions and various packages outside of, of base R have different names for uh, getting the probabilities, specifically for like a classification setting. Um, so that can be really frustrating if you're trying a bunch of different uh, model frameworks and it's like, you know, this package uses prob and this other package uses uh, probability. So you have to like type it out and you, you know, say you don't have partial matching enabled. Uh, and that, that can just be frustrating. Um, uh, so composable, again, this kind of goes along with it. Um, and I think of this as like representing the whole functional paradigm. Uh, you know, you're passing an object to one function, to another function, to another function. It's not all just one function that does everything for you, um, uh, but it's all a decom part, um, you know, separated into like multiple steps. And specifically with, you know, tidy models, I think of that through like recipes where you kind of define, you know, your formula, the pre-processing steps, then parsnip is what you use for fitting, and then tune and dial is what you use um, for yeah, hyperparameter tuning and whatnot. Usually a package has all that and it might be just in, it might just be in one fit function or a fit CV function. Uh, but then another package has, you know, mo like a lot of different functions to do all that work or, or they're like named differently. So it's really nice to have, you know, that a single framework that um, kind of, you know, first of all, separates all those steps uh, so that you can think about them uh, in different ways, right? Like there's, uh, some packages that, you know, they don't do any of the pre-processing for you. In fact, that's most modeling packages. You have to do that outside of um, the package. Um, and then it gets hard. Maybe like there is, maybe there is NAs in your data. And so the package handles like automatically omits them for you. So then when you make a prediction, your, you know, your output vector is kind of a different size in uh, the data frame that you passed in. And it's just unexpected behavior. So it's nice to have like a consistent framework. Uh, you know, that separates you know, the pre-processing, the fitting, and the model tuning afterwards uh, to really help you as an analyst know what you're doing. Um, and it just makes it, your workflow easier. Uh, and then finally, just uh, inclusivity. Uh, we see this with our studio and tidy models, the tidyverse team. Um, I think, uh, you know, they're great at uh, asking for feedback. Uh, so like, you know, they're pretty opinionated. It's, opinion, it's an opinionated framework, but they're also willing to you know, listen uh, to what, you know, people submitting issues uh, have to say. So I think that's great about them. Obviously, there's a lot more you can say to this, but I think, you know, just for, uh, in terms of talking about tidy models and tidy risks, uh, that's what we can say. So, yeah, that's it. Awesome. We have a lively discussion going in the chat about uh, subgrouping, which I will put into the channel uh, tomorrow, but I think we're probably going to have some more talking about it about now. <laughs> but thank you for that, for the talk. Cool. It's very good. Could have used a few more memes, but <laughs> it'll do. It is a relatively I, short I chapter. Like I felt like I was being too serious. I was like, this isn't my normal <laughs> mode here. But uh, I don't know, it's, it's important information. So. Yeah. <laughs> so anyone want to try? Oh. Yeah. Lots of thanks coming in in the chat. Um, I think I really like Connor's summary of the whole subgrouping conversation that 
Um, sounds like subgrouping lets you turn non-tree models into a model with more tree-ish logic. I think that is a good way to kind of, you know, breaking it apart. I'm still not clear if it's if that's used for inference or prediction or both. I think it can be used, like both can be used for both, right? Like, but I would say the, the general uh, tendency, right, is to use that dummy, the dummy um, variables for inference and the submodels for prediction. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't say it's exclusive to one or the other. That's just, um, I guess, my initial thought on that. Yeah, kind of the way I've seen it used mostly is just, um, like I said, robustness testing, just to make sure the model um, fits each subgroup or each, uh, you know, use a lot in, in psychological um, studies, that kind of stuff. Okay, but but it does, so, so that's a benefit. But the, is a trade off that it makes it less interpretable? Since the uh, different things and different subgroups? Yeah, you, usually you would. Um, Typically, you would run one model and then just test for robustness to make hmm. sure that it does fit everybody well. And if it fails robustness, then you'd adjust the model. Um, but that's that's not not from a machine learning type perspective. Uh, when you start thinking about more like trees, I think it makes it a lot more applicable to the subgroups. And I think it'd be a neat a neat addition to the um, allowing you to fit different models to different subgroups. John, is this, um, or Tony, the presentation that you did here, is this in the current book that's on or is it going to get uploaded later? Uh, I will uh, make a pull request and yeah, okay. upload it after this. Just making sure I wasn't doing something wrong. It, it, it didn't have that on there yet. Yeah. yeah. No, it's not there yet. The learning objectives are, but that's it. I didn't have like all this planned out. I just used the tree data set because I thought it would, it's just a different data set. Then I like realized it kind of came up with like different plots. Like, so in the book, <laughs> uh, when I, you know, they did ANOVA, it was like uh, the extra term wasn't significant, but it was significant here. I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. I'm being cool and different here. Uh, but, yeah. Cool. Anyone have any other questions for Tony or for? the chat or for discussion. We're still getting into um, getting into the basics. And on that note, so next week we have the Ames housing data. I'm not sure yet what I think about this being a separate chapter, but I, I think I want to stick with the idea of us um, going through the book one chapter at a time, even if it seems super short. I think next week is going to be super short. So if you're a little nervous about presenting, I think next week's a good week. So someone should take it. So who wants to present about the Ames housing data? It's like a one section chapter. Of course, the slightly hard part is trying to, you know, come up with interesting facts about it or you don't have to come up with memes that we, we just make Tony do that because he did it once in chat or something. And so it became Tony's thing. Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> oh, Tan wants to present. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see like a full blown shiny up with this Amos housing data. That would be a good way to present it. Let us explore it, Tan. Yeah. No pressure. You're muted, I, I think, because, you know, clearly you should be saying yes. I'm super excited and uh, accidentally volunteering myself again. Yeah, if you, if, you want to, if you want to explore Ames with a... Actually, I've, ever, I've never actually used Leaflet, so let's see if I can put it together in a week with everything else going on right now. Uh, no big yeah, deal. Should, if not, um, I think we should probably... Let's see. Is this... Are we coming up on a section... Um, oh no, so this is starting the basics section as well. So, mm -hmm. um, 
I don't know. It's super short. Uh, if you get into it and it's like, I can't even make a presentation about this because it's so, so short. We could also do chapter five. Um, but I like the idea, again, of kind of taking it slow and really... Oh, there's already a shiny app. That's lame. Not lame, but you know what I mean. It well, exists already. Then, you know, you could present that or you could develop your own uh, fork of that. So, all right. So we'll, we'll talk about aims next week. Um, there's no map in that shiny app. So, okay, still add the leaflet. All right, I could try that. Very cool. Hey, Tan, uh, uh, real quick, I do have a sort of a shiny app of my own I've been working on. It's not the Ames, that is separate, it's similar housing sales. So I, okay. I can shoot you some code if you want to look at it. Awesome. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, like for the leaflet part? Yeah, yeah, it's leaflet and then it predicts on new data. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to look at that. Cool. All right. So, so Tan will present next week. Uh, same, same time. Um, only a slightly new world for next week as of tomorrow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Back in so, politics. Gotta yeah, yep. Can't, can't <laughs> avoid it. All right. Well, so. I could, I really, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, guys. See y'all later. All right. So, see y'all next week. Thanks again, Tony. Bye, everyone. Bye.